Okay, friends. Well, welcome to APS Stamp Chat. It's really great to see everyone. Happy Monday. I hope you all enjoyed a refreshing weekend. Um, it is our pleasure to have so many people on the call, and we appreciate all of you who are APS members. Remember, we have our excellent deal happening right now, which is for all our friends that are under 30 years old, you can join the APS for $25 and we had our friend over at Exploring Stamps, Graham Beck, help us make a promotional video to support this project. So once again, Philately is showing great collaboration and the enthusiasm uh, during this time in particular for stamp collecting throughout all the generations. So thank you so much. A lot of that momentum comes from you coming on the stamp chat and your interaction with us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. So thank you so much. We are feeling your energy and uh, so are other people. So we're, we're really making traction here for the hobby. Um, we have as our guest today, Scott Tiffany. I love when Scott's on because he talks about one of my favorite subjects, which is libraries. I love books. Um, and I'm sure so many of you do, especially for research purposes. Uh, there's no greater library, at least in my humble opinion, than the APRL. And I'm sure that so many of you as members use the services that are, that are provided through your membership for the APRL, uh, for the research library. And um, we have some really cool things that are being kicked off by the APRL. And Scott Tiffany is so excited to share them with you that I'm gonna quit talking and we're gonna turn the camera right over to him. So welcome Scott Tiffany to Stamp Chat. Thank you, Heidi, and thank you, Heidi, also for the opportunity to present a couple of uh, things that are going to be going on at the APRL, in, uh, one that's already underway and one that's coming in, late in October. So what I'd like to do, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to introduce you to two sort of happenings, if you will, that are taking place in the library. One of them is our Adopt-A-Book program, which we started last Monday, a week ago. And the second thing I'd like to talk about today is the Postal History Symposium, which we will be having hopefully at the APC uh, in late in October. Um, after that, uh, once I just have about a brief little talk about those, if there's anything specific that you'd like to talk about with the library, what we're doing right now, the services we're providing during this time, or just anything you'd like to ask about the library, please feel free. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this will just give me a moment here exactly it can take a few moments for it to make it happen am i going to say hello to all our youtube friends that will be watching the recording boy i have seen people coming in from croatia australia new zealand so it's an international happening, friends. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. Feeling better about that? Is it sharing yet? Not yet. Doesn't want to seem to slide over. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm not doing here. Okay. Well. If the, are these on Google Slides, Scott? Could, uh, there's no, just a PowerPoint presentation, actually. Okay. So I was going to say you could send them to me and we could, but in the meantime, you can go ahead and talk about. Uh, just doesn't want to share. Am I a presenter? 
you you are a presenter. Let me double check on that though. Okay. Yep, you're a presenter. Okay, I'll hit the share screen button again. Okay, here we go, I think. Are we sharing yet? Yeah. Here we go. Weird. There we go. Okay, so what you'll want to do, though, is have your, there you go. Yep, pull that presentation. Thanks, friends, for your patience. Yes, thank you. So. Beautiful. Two of the th things that we're going to talk about today are the Adopted Book Program, as I say, and the Postal History Symposium. First on the adopt the book program. This is a program that we started our campaign. We started on Monday of this week or this past week, I should say. And the aim of the program is to increase the APRL's digital presence. I think we can all appreciate during this time where we're sort of remote and we, there's a stay at home orders and things like that, how wonderful it is to have uh, the APRL digital database available to us. Uh, we have it free for member and non-member right now. If you don't know of that yet, if you go to the APS website and you go to the library page, scroll down on the right-hand side of the page and there's a password and ID information for you to use. What we're trying to provide through the adopt the book campaign is just a general fund that will help us going forward with digital projects. We want to continue to grow and populate APRL digital and have that sort of as a, a great way for members who can't necessarily come to the, the APC, although we'd love to have you, that you can access a larger and larger portion of materials in the collection. We also at this time want to start expanding the scope of the digital materials that we have available in APRL Digital, and the funds will go towards that as too. Right now, if, if those of you who have used APRL Digital know, the Primary sort of content in the database are journals. We have 10 different journal runs, complete runs of different journals, the American Philatelist, the Collectors Club Philatelist, Postal History, and a few others, where you can search full text, you can print, download, save, uh, search uh, complete, uh, complete runs of journals. So what we want to do with this campaign is to sort of start thinking about other things that we'd like to have digitized. We want to expand into things like obviously some books and some other materials that we have in our collection, like photographs uh, and other maybe archival materials and artifacts. Right now, the, the I had to sort of sort of respond to a gentleman who sort of donated a, a very generous donation to the campaign. The name of the campaign, Adopt the Book, might sort of suggest to someone that hey, if I, adopt this, if I donate a certain amount of money, I can select a book and then you, we digitize it in the library. It's really not where we're at at the moment. Uh, eventually, we do want to get to that point where somebody or members or a number of members can come to us and say, hey, we'd really like this particular book to be digitized at this time. And once we have enough funds through, a pro through this program to where we can do that, that's certainly something we would like to entertain. But right now we're just looking to sort of have members donate to the campaign, adopt a book, they will receive a book plate that will, will sort of be in the book that will mention their donation and sort of make reference to the donation. Down the road, hopefully we will be able to sort of digitize books as members sort of bring them to our attention. So what are our needs? Uh, like any sort of large scale digitization project, uh, we have a variety of things that the funds will go towards. I was talking with uh, Heidi just before the talk here about uh, sort of the large scale digitization project that we're doing at the, in the library. Previously to coming to the APS, I worked with the National Park Service. And one of the jobs, there was an eight year uh, position. One of the jobs I was tasked with was going to national parks and digitizing their more, more important documents. And so what I was doing was going to the parks, scanning their sort of impact state, impact, environmental impact reports, environmental 
impact assessment reports, things like that, so that then they could put them on their websites. And that was really simple, just scan the document, save it as a PDF, put it up on the website. This project goes well beyond that. And so we're not only sort of scanning the documents, but we're doing things like OCR, which is optical character recognition, which also includes sort of being able to search a document full text. And so the scanning aspect of the projects, when we say take a journal, for example, an issue of a journal, and we scan it, that's really only a third of what's involved in getting it up into the digital database. Scanning the item, we have to then OCR the document to make sure that it reads all the characters on the page. We have to quality control that sort of document to make sure it is finding the words on the page when somebody does a search. So the other thing that we're sort of looking for, obviously there's hardware involved. We're very fortunate at the APRL that we have three book edge scanners in the library. Two are in the public space, one on the first floor, one on the second floor. But we also have a book edge scanner in a private area of the library for staff and volunteers to use. We also have, if you've been to the library, the large overhead scanner, and we plan to use all of these scanners for our needs. So hardware is not really an issue for us. It's just more the maintenance on that hardware. So if a scanner were to break down or it needs an upgrade or something like that. We also have costs involved with software as well as the platform upgrades and maintenance. So right now we use OCLC's content DM as a, as the software platform for our digital da database. And it gets constant updates, it gets constant maintenance. Every once in a while it'll crash. You would never notice that because we have the storage offsite and OCLC takes care of any sort of flaws that come into the database, any errors that come up. And immediately, if, if something sort of snags in the database, you immediately are taken to another copy of the database. So it's a seamless sort of transition, but that costs. And so I mentioned also that uh, our storage is offsite. So there's also expenses involved with that. And then as we do digitize things and scan them and OCR them, there's always personnel that we have. We have in the past sort of used digital interns, and these are usually people that we know locally that can come in and do some scanning for us. We also have some people that offsite do some scanning for us. But a lot of times we just hire someone on a part-time basis to come in and say, you know, scan these many issues of a particular journal and they, that's when they do that for us. And so those are always costs in, involved with that too. What are the member benefits of the campaign? Uh, one of the main member benefits is obviously increased access to the library's digital collections. We want to, this chance, although unfortunate, this opportunity, I say this time that we're in, although a very unfortunate time due to the health crisis, is a great opportunity for us to sort of reassess how we sort of can provide greater and greater access to our members to the digital collections of the library. And so that's what we're trying to do. We also think the April, the, the, the adopted book program is also a great opportunity for our members to engage in the process and implementation as, as the library grows its digital collection. We really want to keep members involved in what we're doing. We don't want to sort of say, oh, this is just a project that we're working on in the library and then one day we'll show it to you. We really want their involvement. And one of the ways that members can be involved is obviously donating to this campaign. But also, as I mentioned earlier, I am always interested in hearing ideas for things that we should be doing with the database or resources that you'd like to see in the database, whether that be books, whether that be things from our archives, whether that be things in our journal collection, uh, anything that you feel that should be in the, in the digital database, we would love to hear about it. Um, there are certain sort of copyright restrictions, obviously. We can't just sort of digitize anything that we have in the collection. There are copyright restrictions. And we also want, don't want to duplicate what's already been done. So if, we, if, someone, if a member comes to us and say, hey, can we get a copy of this in the digital database? What I'm going to do is sort of search to see if that digital copy is available somewhere else. And if we can't sort of download that and put it, that into our digital database, we'll certainly have a link to that resource and where it's found online. And finally, one of the sort of, I think, really unique sort of opportunities for the adopt -a book campaign for members is that we're going to put a book plate in the book or resource that you select uh, to adopt 
and then give a donation in honor of. So we have various levels for that. Uh, the majority of the materials will be in the main book collection, but you can adopt other items in the collection. We have a close tax area. We have uh, our archives area, obviously. We have a rare books area. For those things that we deem shouldn't have a book plate in them necessarily because of their quality, or we don't want to damage the book in some way, or we don't want to damage the rare book or the archival item, we will find some other way to put some way to honor uh, the donation in that collection. We we'll either put a book, something that looks like a bookmark or something, maybe a sign or something like that. But people will know that that particular resource has been adopted by someone as part of the adopt a book program. What our challenge, what our goals are right now, we'd like to initially set a goal of $25,000 to sort of get us started uh, with the, with uh, on this program to digitize more of the collection. And that's going to be a starting point. We'd obviously like to sort of this fund to continue over time so that we can then, as things arise with members who want certain things digitized, that we can go ahead and do that for them. So the campaign website is found here. And I'm just going to click on that. And we should be taken to the first page of the site, a little slow internet today, but hopefully we'll get there. Really simple, I'm just gonna take you through a quick walkthrough of what the site looks like. And I, I love that you reiterated that, you know, with archival books, I hadn't thought of that until last year. So, I mean, last week. You're gonna put a, a, a plate. Yes, in the book, yeah. We have so many people don't they pass on this just jamming up the website people <laughs> uh i may pass on this for now but that's the link to the site uh, see if i can get that closed i'll pass on that for now okay. but that's the link when you go to the site, there's a couple of different ways that you can donate and you can there's a button right at the that top that there's a button right at the top where it says you can donate now and you can then click and then you go to a donation page where you can then decide what amounts you want to donate. Uh, you fill in your donation information, your, your name, your address, things like that, as well as uh, how you're going to pay. Right now, the only option that we have for donating to the site is credit card. If you do want to donate by check, uh, certainly contact me in the library, just at library at stamps.org, and we can sort of uh, go about sort of having the check by or the donation by check. It's not a problem at all, uh, either way. The biggest thing that we'd like people to do when they donate uh, to the campaign is that on that on the second page where you don't you tell which uh, level of donation that you want to donate at, is there's a leave a comment box. And what we'd like people to do as part of the, in, in the name of the program, is to put in uh, the, the book that they want to adopt, the book that they want a book plate in, and then tell us a little story about why you've decided to select that book. And so what we wanna share those stories with other people who are interested in possibly donating as well. I'm just gonna try this one more time, see if we can get to it while I keep talking. And there's a really, uh, so we want to hear about those stories that of uh, people adopting uh, to the web to a particular book. So that we can put a book plate in there and share their story uh, about the, uh, the campaign. So hopefully we'll get this up and running. I was working this morning. Yeah, it doesn't sound, seem to want to. Behind the yeah. scenes, I can be looking at that. So. that. Well, everyone has the link in there. Um, in the, you have it on the chat, and we've been looking at it. So, you there, Scott?
Oh boy, did we lose our speaker? <laughs> Ray Cal went to look. I know, I think we lost our speaker. Well, let's go over here to, uh, has everybody gone over to the link, the supportstamps.org, adopt a book? Oh yeah, okay, good, good. Now, I can't see many webcams while we wait for our friend to return. How many people use the library services program? You do, Rick? Okay, that's good. Feel free to uh, write in the comment box. And there's Frank, you do too. Nice. I mean, and are there particular subjects that you're looking at when you're or looking for that we have? Good. Let's do it well. Thank you. So Scott uses Scott Vieira uses the catalog extensive for re, extensively for research. I've used it for the different journals, right? Exactly, right? Rick Howell and I just at the same time. Same here. Rick likes the old journals. Some great articles. Uh, there's, it's incredible how you can go back to journals like 50, 80 years ago and you find information that is so relevant. Instead, interested in accessing digital copies of the journal. So Michael Jones, we I am certain we're going to get uh, Scott back, but he was just talking about that in the, in the, the prologue to uh, Stamp Chat today. He was talking about that. I think 10 different journals have been um uploaded that's really where a lot of the muscle the digital muscle has gone is into those into the journals hi scott tiffany welcome back my apologies we had a bit of a power failure here so uh, up and running again great well i got to learn that many of our members use our services so it's wonderful good so I will go back to sharing my screen, if that's okay. Okay. Are we there? Uh, we are on a frozen screen. Okay. How's that? We're at your screen, and then you'll just have to open up your PowerPoint again, friends. Thank you so much for your patience. We hope that that weekend refreshment is keeping you <laughs> on the line. I was going to advance forward into the section we were talking about. So I, I mentioned our challenge is about 25,000 and we'd like to sort of grow this uh, after that as well. Our campaign website, that's it there. And uh, with the internet being a little slow today, I'm, we'll look into that at, at another time. There's a really great how-to on the APS first page. If you go to the APS website, on the very first page at the top, there's a adopt a book how-to. So just click on that link and it'll walk you through how to go about adopting a book in the library for this campaign. Uh, the next thing I'd like to sort of talk about is the Postal His History Symposium. Uh, this is the symposium that that's, takes place every other year. Uh, it's been sponsored since 2006 by the APS, the APRL, and the National Postal Museum. And what it is, it's a forum for philatelists, for researchers, for postal historians, and the general public to come and present research and discuss philately and postal history within the context of world history. Um, we've done this every other year for last year, or sorry, I should say in 2018, we'd had it at the Postal Museum. 
Uh, and this is our 11th symposium. Uh, usually it's a two day symposium. This year it will be as well from October 30th to 31st. Uh, we have about 13 speakers so far. Uh, if you're interested in being a speaker, there's certainly time to sort of apply for that. And I'll get into that a little later. But if you just want to come and uh, hear the speakers, hear the talks, there are some other things to, that will be taking place during the event as well. The theme for this year is postal innovation of the classic area, evolution leading to modernization. And I'll get into that in a little more detail later. Uh, the classic era we've defined as pre-1940. Uh, because this year we're co-sponsored by the U.S. Classic Society, uh, we've decided to sort of limit the sort of period for most of the, the presentations to the classic area, but we've expanded it out a little more to, to include not just U.S., but also worldwide. So some of the uh, due dates that uh, are occurring right now, uh, what I'd like from anybody who's interested in, in giving a talk uh, or giving a presentation on during the symposium, uh, if they could present or email me a one page proposal and a brief CV uh, to on May 15th of, of next month. So. I may extend that out uh, because of what's happened recently. We may sort of change that date. I may extend it out to another month, maybe in June. But for now, we have it at May 15th. And then once we sort of, once I hear from speakers, I'm going to then contact them about papers that they can present and have those due by September 1st. Some of the other events, if you're not interested in giving a talk or a presentation, uh, we will. you can sit in on any of the papers or presentations that are given. It'll be two days, it'll be a Friday and a Saturday. We're also gonna have a dealer board. So we're hoping to have up to 15 dealers at that time. And the US Classic Society is going to bring over 150 world-class frames on postal history from their members and from their collections. Another important event during uh, this symposium will be an awards banquet on the Friday evening. And we have keynote speaker, Scott Treppel, who is the president of Robert Siegel Auctions, and he will be giving a talk at, at the uh, awards banquet. We also have a meet and greet planned for the evening of Thursday, October 29th to sort of kick off the symposium. And that will be uh, for those who have arrived already in town, just to sort of meet up with other symposium attendees. Uh, here's the symposium uh, website. It's on the, the, if you go to the library page and you scroll down the right-hand side of the page, I won't click on this, uh, but if you scroll down the right-hand side of the page, uh, you'll find all the important information there, the call for papers and other things as well. Uh, giving a listing of the events that are going to take place as things become more finalized, once we know the number of speakers that we have and when they're going to be sort of presenting their papers, I will post that there as well. There will also be updates on the awards banquets, how to go about getting tickets and what meals will be involved uh, at the awards banquet. Uh, with that, I really apologize for the technical difficulties, but uh, I'm really open to any questions on the adoptive book program or anything to do with the Postal History Symposium or really anything to do with the, the library as well. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and just throw it open to anybody who would, who has any questions about the library, about the services we're providing. I'll give you a brief sort of, we are sort of still doing things in the library. We still have some uh, resources that we have available. I've been fielding most of the requests that come in. The ones I can answer from home, when I left the library, I grabbed a lot of catalogs and things like that just to have here at home. Uh, so I've been able to answer a few things, things that we can do remotely. Uh, other things we'll, we'll just do as, as, as soon as we get back. We've been sort of documenting the requests as they come in, and then we'll answer them in the order in which they came in. Uh, with that, I'll throw it back to Heidi. And if there's any questions that you have, please feel free to ask. Okay. 
Thank you. Again, I always love learning about the library. It is one of the highlight services that the AP has, including, or the APS, including, of course, the magazine and expertizing and all the great things that you get. But the access to the AP is, or the APRL is very special. Um, I see a few questions. Um, Lloyd, if you'd like, you're, you're more than welcome to... You know, you guys can let me know if you want me to unmute you or answer your quest or ask your questions. I, I don't want to take away your voice if you'd prefer to be, um, you know, asking your question. So I'll go ahead with Lloyd's uh, just so to the rest of you guys, if you want to ask it. Lloyd asked, will the symposium be broadcast live or uh, recorded for YouTube? Uh, I don't. I think that it's going to be it's going to be videotaped live. Uh, I wouldn't mind uh, recording these uh, simply because then we can use them as content for the library's uh, webpage as well as the APS website. Uh, that those are permissions that I'm hoping to get from speakers. Uh, I think in the past we have recorded a number of them. And if you do get a chance to go to the Postal History Symposium page on the library webpage, there are some there that have been recorded in the past. So I do, I am pushing to sort of have them recorded so that we can have them available. Although live streaming them, I don't think that there's any, we're gonna be doing that uh, for the symposium. Um, okay, Greg, I know doesn't have a mic. So this is Greg's question. Will the Classic Society show be a WSP event? Will they, sorry, what, sorry, go ahead. Uh, will the Classic Society be a no. WSP event? Uh, no, not as far as I know. There's no actual, the, the, the exhibits that they're gonna be showing are just uh, non-competitive. They're just showing them. They're, it's not gonna be a competitive show. Uh, it's not a WSP show, no. Okay. Um, Michael Jones, did you want to ask your question live or I'll give you three, two, one. Okay, I'm reading it from Michael Jones. Scott, do you have a goal of how much of the library to digitize did, that you, how much of the lib, library to digitize, for example, 10% right. ballpark estimate? I mean, I don't have a percentage that I would like digitized. What my goal is that uh, right now, if I were to sort of speak off the top of my head, I'd love to have some of the, the major journals digitized and we do have some of them digitized already. I'd like to continue on that, that, that sort of track, if you will. I hear from organizations all the time. I actually have 14 societies and clubs that have contacted me that would love to have complete runs of their journals up on our site. So that is something that's in the queue as we speak. In fact, I'm working with Marion Mills, our technical services coordinator to get those up and running. I just sent her a batch of some of those uh, today and we'll send her a few more this afternoon and tomorrow of digital files that clubs have sent to us of their newsletters, for example, or their society journals. That they have given us permission to now put up on the site. In terms of books, there are certainly some one-of-a-kind books that we would love to get up up on the site. Uh, that uh, I'd love to hear from members about things that they would like up on the site. Uh, I don't have a ballpark figure. I mean, in an ideal world, I'd love to have most of it. 50% of it would be great. I think that's a long, long way out. It does take time to digitize the material. It does take time to get it uploaded onto the site. But for now, for this campaign, boy, it'd be nice to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 10%, 5% of what we have and find and try to pick out uh, material that we have uniquely in our collection that we can sort of put up on the site. I would love that. And that is a, we were talking before the show, that's a very painstaking process, friends, to yeah. digitize. I think the thinking is sometimes, and I know I came into it, I've only worked on smaller scale projects of digitization. Uh, when, you're, when you're getting into the realm of OCR, which allows your optical character which allows you to 
to search a document full text, a scanned image in full text, so that you can search for any word on that particular page. It takes a little longer. The scanning is only a third of the process. There's the scanning, there's the OCR in which you sort of try to get it to read full text. There's the quality control in terms of making sure images are straight, making sure images, say pictures of stamps or covers look correct, are in the right color. For example, we scan everything in color, even if the page is just black and white, uh, just so that we make sure that we get the, solar, the right context for the particular thing that we're scanning. It takes a while. I mean, I, I think, uh, when in working with a digital intern, for example, uh, recently, we found that on a good day, we could scan between 30 to 40 pages in an hour. And that's just scanning. That's just sitting at a scanner, scanning the page, making sure the image looks correct, and then scanning the next page. I mean, it takes about that long just to do the scanning. And then the OCR and the uploading takes uh, similar amounts of time sometimes to say upload a particular say 10 pages to the to the site so it does take a while when you get documents that are unique sizes for example marion's been working on a number of exhibits that don't come in nice eight and a half by 11 size so some of those images are larger larger they're like 11 by 14 or they're odd sizes mm -hmm. and so you have to sort of find a way to sort of make sure it reads the whole page so that when it uploads the image, it takes the whole page. It doesn't try to crop it down to a smaller size. So there's a lot of things to think about. It's a much more detailed process. The scans are great and we can get those done in a reasonable amount of time. But then when you're adding other processes to make it searchable and make it readable, that's what sort of really slows down things. So how has, uh, I mean, with, with, with volunteer week probably is, not happening yeah i mean one of the things that we had last year at volunteer work week was we had uh someone who was just scanning pages we have the heinz airmail collection i think i've mentioned on a number of occasions which are photographs and documents from when airmail flew through belfont and it's a really unique collection it's got pictures of the pilots of the planes of the airfields that were used in early airmail we also have a really great collection of AP, what I call historical APS photographs, uh, old uh, stamp shows, old uh, APS conventions from back in the early 1900s all the way to the present. And we had somebody on, during volunteer work week scanning those, those images so that we could have sort of a nice historic, historic uh, a nice collection of hist the history of the APS and APS conventions. And so those are things too that we'd like to sort of get up into the database. So yeah, so volunteer work week was a great opportunity for us to sort of have volunteers helping us with our scanning of the documents. We have a question from Greg. If someone would like to submit scans of their exhibit pages, what format and resolutions should they use? Uh, well, Greg, if you could contact the library, library at stamps.org, what we have to do for uh, the sizing in terms of the resolutions, usually 300 DPI. Uh, if it has a lot of images on it, which I imagine an exhibit would have, uh, we prefer 600 DPI, obviously in color. And in terms of sizing, uh, we don't have to change uh, the format in any way. Uh, we like PDF. If, if that's possible, but we can work with any format and we can convert it to what we need. The, the images that you see up on, on the digital collections database are in PDF, but uh, it can be in TIFF, it can be in JPEG, it can be in anything, and we can convert it to PDF. If you can put it in PDF, that's great. And we can work with that. Uh, the one thing I, I do ask that people contact us about when it comes to exhibits, there's a form that we have to send up to the exhibitor. And it's basically a clearance form that says, uh, you are the creator of this exhibit, that uh, you give us permission to use it um, in this way or in this way or in this way. And the, the two different ways obviously are, we can have a copy of it in the library collection, a physical paper copy only. We can have a physical copy as well as put it up on our website in digital form for people to use. So. We need to have those permissions from the exhibitor first before we can do anything with it. Great. What can people do? Can can anyone help uh, 
from their homes? Can anyone help from the library? Or? Uh, in terms of sort of help other than digital projects, uh, Marion Mills is, is the per, con, sort of contact person I am as well. What we're having people do, we've had people do this for years and years for us. There's a gentleman who's done it for the last 15 years for us. And it's article indexing. So they take journals that they have and they index the articles in them. And there's a format that we use. There's an Excel spreadsheet that we use to sort of put the information in. And so when they index the article, they give me the, us the title, the author, the page numbers, what the some subject terms. Then we can upload that into our online catalog and so that we have access to those articles, not access in terms of digital copies, but we have references to those articles. So we have a number of different people doing LINs for us. We've had the AP done for years. We have the Collectors Club Philatelist. We have someone who does the Air Post Journal for us. And it's, a, it's, a, it's just basically sort of taking journals that you may already have in your collections and indexing the articles that appear in each of the issues for us. So uh, that's a project that someone can definitely contact me about if they're interested. And we can get them in touch with, we have a nice set of instructions that they can use and an Excel spreadsheet that we like to use, and then they can go from there. And uh, we have a number of our staff do that. And that's another big project that we have people do at uh, Volunteer Work Week. But it's something you can do remotely. It's just going through your journal collection and going through the issues of journals that you have and indexing the articles for us. Uh, I think this might be, this is from Rick Howe. Can those indices be made available? Uh, they are already available. They're on, if you go to the online catalog and you search for an article, uh, say you want an article in Linz, you can do a search for, I know this article by say Wayne Youngblood appeared in Linz. You can do a search right now in the online catalog for articles. They're by no means, uh, when you look at our second floor and all the journals we have, we have maybe 1%, 2%, maybe 5% of those journals indexed. It's a mammoth project. And that's why I always like to hear from volunteers who are willing to do this for us. But we do have certain journals, which we do have indexed to a certain amount. But no, they're already in the catalog, uh, in the online catalog. Right. The references now, these are not, you don't go to the catalog and search for this article by Wayne Youngblood and Linz, and there's a copy of it. It's not, it's just a reference to that article. Okay. How has the response been to the adopt a book, Scott? It's been good. Uh, we've had uh, a number of donations so, so far. I have five so far. Two people have contacted me and just provided checks. And people have just been very generous. I mean, some people have even gone beyond the donation levels that we have already. And so that's really sort of encouraging. It's good. It's taking time. It's a, you know, it's gaining some momentum now. I'm trying to get the word out. Uh, had the word up on the news portion of the of the APS website, and sort of the word's getting out now. We're starting to do a little more uh, advertising about it and promotion of it, and so hopefully it'll it, it'll pick up. Uh, I know a number of people have contacted me, and a lot of times they're just curious as to what it is and how do I go about doing it. So uh, it's I think it's going to pick up in the next couple of weeks. So I'm really I'm really encouraged by it and I think once people realize this really really does help us when we want to sort of start digitizing things in our collection that we can sort of then make available to members remotely wherever they are. Wherever they are. Um, so when somebody wants say there's two people that want the same book how are you handling that? Well we have two copies of every book in our collection so there's always that uh, if there's two people that want to sort of adopt the same book, uh, we, we may have to, I don't want to sort of put two book plates in the same book. I prefer not to do that because uh, I think people select books for a certain reason and they mean something to them. Uh, hopefully we can sort of resolve those issues with the person and sort of if there's another book, if, if those two copies of that book already have a book plate, then we can resolve that issue somehow. We can make this work. It's not a, uh, we don't want to sort of discourage anybody from donating to the campaign. Uh, we just want to encourage people to do so, but we can certainly make something work and we can certainly offer up possibly other items in the collection that they might be interested in. 
we have about 23,000 book titles in our collection. So two copies of each, we have about 46,000 options. Uh, but I understand that some people may sort of pick the same book and we'll sort of certainly work with both of them to sort of see what we can do. And how are you collecting the stories? Uh, you can do that. Had I been able to sort of get into the adopt a book uh, site, there's a, as I say, there's a leave a comment. And so when you leave a comment, we want people to sort of name the book that they're adopting and then tell us, the, tell us the story behind it. I've already had two really wonderful stories about two of the books that people have adopted that uh, we're going to share, obviously, on the adopt a book site. They appear on the very first page of the site. And uh, so we're going to share those stories in the AP. We'll share those stories on the library page and in the library blog as well, sort of to encourage others just to sort of, I think that's what for me is the most interesting. I'm a book lover. I've, I love the reason I work in libraries is that I love being around books and I love the stories behind the books that we, that we enjoy and the, the books that we've used in our collecting. And I, we want to hear those stories. Those are the, that's the best part of, the whole campaign is hearing those stories. It is the best part. Now I can I could screen share the 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 adopt a book if you'd like. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So here is the site. Scott, you're you're more than welcome to just tell me what to do here. So that's the how to uh, that I have on the news page. Okay. And this basically just walk you through how to how to provide a donation so if you scroll down there should be a link i think in the second paragraph to say adopt a book if you go just above that image there that you have in the middle of the page maybe we can actually go to the site here uh, right above that above that picture yeah, right there yeah Oh, beautiful. So here's the page here. And uh, what you see there, the number of people have adopt, who uh, the three is the donations. I've also had two by check. So uh, that number is a little larger. That's what we have in the campaign so far. Nice. And you can click on that donate now. Uh, don't click on it. No. But you click on that donate button now. And basically, that takes you to the donation page where you can choose to donate at any level you want. So if you keep scrolling down, it gives a little information about the campaign. Here's where you can select a particular level to adopt. So we have the general collections level, which is anything that's in the general collection. Uh, usually on the first floor, when you walk in the library, there's all the things you can browse. Uh, the second one is the closed stacks. And there's different donation levels for each of these. In the closed stacks area is where we have books that are, say, kind of a one of a kind or limited edition or a special edition of a book that uh, we don't like necessarily having in the general collection of the library. We have them in a particular area. Certainly people can access, access those, but they're sort of for, uh, we don't want them sort of out in the general collection. Then we have what are called resource collections. And we thought what we do here, if somebody wanted to name a complete run of a journal, for example, say you wanted to name the Air Post Journal, the name of that. So at, at adopting at that level, you could name that journal, That's the title. Cool. Yeah. Or, or you could sort of name, say, some of our, our uh, stamp catalog collections. So like the Gibbons collection or the Scott catalogs or the US, special, uh, US specialized catalog or something on that level. And then obviously there's the archives and rare books. These are very rare items in our collection. They don't see the light of day too often other than when people come to visit us. But you can certainly adopt one of those books at that adoption level as well, at that donation level. And you can click any of those buttons and that's what takes you to the next page. So if you click on one of those buttons, Heidi. Mm -hmm. I'm going for archive, of course. Okay. Although I love the journal one. Mm -hmm. It'll take you to the donation page. So you'll notice that it's already sort of highlighted the adoption area at the 250 is already highlighted. It gives you the oh, option yeah. of donating just once, or you can donate at this level monthly. 
and it'll always sort of tell you at the bottom, do you want to donate monthly or just once? Uh, if you keep scrolling down. I like uh, this, dedicate. Here's where you'd enter your, right. Here's where you'd enter your information, personal information. And in that leave a comment box is where we want people to write their stories in the book they selected. Tell us a little bit about the book, why it's important to you, what it means to you, why it's your favorite, and put it in there. And if you keep scrolling down, uh, you see your payment details, and you'll see at the bottom your donation level. And you'll wonder why, why does it say 262? I said 250. There is a fee that the Classy software, which we use, charges. If you don't want to pay that fee, if you go up and just above that, there's a little box that you can uncheck just above, right at the bottom of the page there, Heidi. Right there, right? Uncheck. Right here. Go right to the bottom. Yeah. So that box you can uncheck, and you'll notice it changes back to 250. The APS and eh, not so much. Okay. <laughs> uh, don't press the give now box or else you're going to be donating. Okay. Uh, money. So that's really the page. If at the top here, if you don't, if you can't find your book, uh, you can click on where it says here in that second pair in the third paragraph there. Wow. It says if you already know your book, uh, and it'll take you to the library catalog, and this is where you can search for your book. And you can copy and paste it into the comment box. Wow, you thought of everything, Scott. So if you just do a search for a title, you could find it, copy and paste it, and put it into the. Into, you don't have to, Heidi. Okay. Uh, put it into that box. So if we go back, that's where you would put uh, in the comment com box, and then put it in your comment box. Yeah. That's really it. Uh, and you can donate at any level you'd like. Uh, you can always change your donation level. We would like if you know if you're going to donate something, if you're going to honor something from the archives that you do keep it at that level. Uh, because and we won't put any, as I say, any book plate in a rare book or a very specific book that uh, we're worried about uh, the book plate damaging in any way. Uh, it'll be more like a, maybe a book uh, a bookmark or something like that, a sign that indicates that it's been donated to. Thank you, Heidi. It's such a great program. Yeah, my pleasure. Where was what was the inspiration behind this? Uh, well, a lot of libraries have done this. Uh, Scott English and I talked about a year and a half ago about doing something along these lines, and just thought it would be a great idea for. We were sort of trying to think of a, a, a campaign that it would be good for, and I suggested digitization. Uh, in the past, we've sort of relied on, say, when a club or an organization comes to us and wants us to digitize their journal, we've always gone to them and said, can you help us with uh, some funds towards this so that we can possibly hire a digital intern to sort of do the scanning? Uh, so it just helps us with that kind of funding. Uh, we kept having, having to ask and we, 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 we would pick up some of those costs ourselves, but we would also then be uh, having uh, the, the club or the organization pay some of the costs as well. So it's a way to sort of make it easier for the clubs and the organization so that we can do the digitization ourselves. Have you seen any sort of pickup in, I don't know if you have access to it on, you know, from uh, unless it's a webmaster question, but have you seen any sort of pickup in, in digital library pickup and in traffic, excuse me. Oh, absolutely. I get those I get those numbers and people accessing the APRL digital, the digital collections database has gone significantly up. It's it's almost it's more than quadruple uh, than what we normally get. So well see that really bodes well because anybody who's found their way to the chat you know has a a bent for for adapting or you already are part of you know you, you, you've already uh, applied technology in your life so it's it really bodes well for the hobby because when we see these upticks then we, we we can show that it's it's not such an analog hobby not that there's anything wrong with an analog hobby but that, that people can make the jump all right and i know people out there have seen other sites that have done incredible things too and we're, we're sort of pushing that more and more we have to i think this time has sort of really emphasized that fact that we really have to provide things remotely to our members and this is one of those services that we can provide and we want to continue to grow for our members so that they can access the library they don't have to physically be here 
to sort of access some of the resources that we have, because we do have very unique resources in the library. There, some of them are one of a kind, and we'd really like to have those materials available to our members wherever they are. Because as of now, it's you. We prior to the COVID, you could get the book and then have it sent to you, unless you were internet. Yeah. Well, Right, and so right now we just don't have that access. And so it's really come to bear that we need to do more and more of that and have, we have to grow that. And it's sort of, we'd like our, our members to be involved in that process and to sort of help us with that, that process because we definitely want to take the library there. We want to share the library with the world. It's really what we want to do. And we still want you to all come to beautiful Belfont as well because that, yeah. the, the, the APRL really is quite a beautiful it, it, building it, it's lovely all that glass that's what i can wax poetically on i just love the building mm -hmm. itself uh do copyright laws prevent you from digitizing books and making them available uh, yeah so co u.s copyright law is uh fairly strict uh a, a rule of thumb on say say somebody publishes a book the rule of thumb is 70 years after the author's death so it's a very strict, and that doesn't take into account that say if a book is reprinted or re-updated, then that 70 years is added on to that as well. Aye. So unless you get the author's permission and the publisher's permission, yes, you just can't. You can't. I know we have. We're, we're so used to a world now where things are at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we get this request in the mm -hmm. library all the time that say we have a document. It's only like 30 pages. Why can't you just make a copy of it and send it to me? And we do have a, a certain latitude in libraries when it comes to fair use. Uh, that's why libraries can borrow, can, you can borrow books from libraries, you can share information from libraries, but we can't make, say something, a book that was published a couple of years ago available to you know our 30,000 members. We just can't do that because that goes way beyond fair use. So yes, copyright law is pretty strict. Um, we have to be very careful. It's not to say that we can't digitize a book that's been published recently. It's just we would have to get proper permissions to do so. Rick says thank you. And, you know, yeah. that, that's one of the tremendous bonuses right now that we're offering is access, just free access on our website to the AP and to the APRL, which would generally be a member only service correct Scott uh, that's correct so right now we have it we have the digital database open uh, and anybody can member or non-member we're really trying to sort of use it as a vehicle for people who are non-members to become members at the end of May that privilege will go away and it'll only be available to members after that and the other thing when you want to borrow a book from the library Heidi was mentioning earlier you can only you only, you can only be you you have to be an APS or APR uh, library member in order to borrow books from the library. Non-members cannot borrow books from the library, so it really does benefit people. And we send books out all the time. It's not that you have to physically come to the library to borrow a book. Most of our borrowing happens remotely. If someone contacts us, wants to borrow a book or a number of books, and we send them out to them. So. Membership does have its privileges, no question. Lots and lots. You, friends, we it's 358 at the parting shot. I want to thank Scott Tiffany so much for joining us and uh, talking about the library. We could go days and days uh, delving into this, and, and we will. I'd like to have Scott Tiffany on as a regular. And if you have any 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 chat ideas, friends, our, our regulars and our new friends, um, Please feel free to, to write to me at Heidi at stamps.org for any questions, comments, ideas. Uh, my inbox is your inbox, so use it. Uh, please, if you have not become an APS member, really, you're going to want to ask yourself why. It's, it's an extremely affordable program. We're talking about $45 uh, annually for U.S. residents, 65 non. You get the paper cop, the hard copy of the AP, not to mention access to the digital library, which is going to be going bye-bye at the end of May. I miss the days of seeing the big wire racks full of book packages. So you can, you can get your books, you can take the stamps off, give them to your stamp,
club, whatever. I mean, membership has its privileges stacked and stacked high. About just as stacked well as uh, the books behind Scott Tiffany. And in the stacks that you too can donate towards. I think it's a what a hundred dollars if I if I adopted a book on the stacks. Yeah, you can you can go you can go 50, 100, 150, 250. Uh, whatever your heart contents feels is, is appropriate. Uh, any anything helps. So Great. for the collection, it's fifty dollars. So yeah. So you you can start with fifty dollars. Be you know, forget the bricks for. Put your put your name in a book. That's where all of our heads are anyway. We're a bunch of eggheads, and it's a beautiful thing. So, on that note, can't wait to uh, talk more with you soon, Scott. And sure. yes, we do have our stamp chats up for the week. Tomorrow we'll be with Dr. Richard Morrill joining us from the British Public Library. He is the curator of the Philatelic Studies. He's going to be talking about, is there a black postal history? So for all of you friends that joined us that wanted to talk specifically about the Postal Historia Symposium, I think tomorrow is gonna to be a show right up your alley. Uh, please join us if you can't remember, all of these chats are being recorded and put up to the APS YouTube for any time viewing and listening. Thanks so much. Membership has its privileges, expertizing library AP and stamp chats. So thanks so much friends for your membership. Rick Howell, Larry, Frank Corwin, Scott, Tiffany, Thank Peter Lilly, Little, Scott, Vieira, Sharon, Lloyd, Stewart, Greg, Beatrix, Marty, Frank again, and Larry, Sarah, adios. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye friends, bye friends.